Good morning. About a season ago, we got together with you all outdoors in the courtyard, and we introduced ourselves to one another. And from that conversation uh, came the idea that maybe we could do worship together. We know that we are separate as the fingers, but whole as the hand in terms of what draws us, the magnet being Jesus Christ. And so we're here today. Joe did a lot of the leadership in uh, getting us here today and making sure everything was in place, and we do appreciate him for taking that lead and for the media working together and just trying to bring us together. So I just want to say it's good to have both groups, um, both uh, churches uh, together today, and maybe this is the beginning of something new, you know, or maybe we'll find ways to do ministry together. So let's be in prayer about that. And today we thought about how we could kind of uh, blend our services so that each church could recognize a little bit of their own church uh, in service. And so we're doing two mini sermons and uh, hopefully I will be short. I tried to cut today. <laughs> I did, I tried real hard <laughs> to cut. So let me get on started. So um, uh, Deacon Plummer encouraged us to, t to talk about uh, gratitude today um, as well. I was doing a series called The Underdog and this is part three of The Underdog. So. Um, trying to do a lot of things and yet hear the good news, hear the word uh, for the people of God. So my sermonic theme is the whistleblower, the whistleblower, Jesus on trial. When I was a kid, I watched my grandmother crochet. In the evenings after work was done and we had eaten dinner, she would sit on her porch with what I call hideous yarn and crochet granny squares. From that process, she made all kinds of afghans that you could see throughout her house, afghans that she gave to other people that she loved. I do not know who taught her how to crochet. I don't know where she got this gift from. I just know that I was sort of the beneficiary. You know how sometimes you journey with people and you don't realize they're giving you something until they're gone. She would give me some yarn sitting there beside her and I would crochet. I remember making this hideous afghan. Actually, I don't remember it. I went home a couple of years ago to see something ugly on my mother's bed. And then I remembered. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh my God, it's alive. <laughs> and it, it, it sort of brought back memories. And so when my, mother, when my grandmother began to decline in health, I started back crocheting. Honestly, it made me feel close to her. I am much slower, but now I find it comforting in long draining meetings to pray with my hands through knitting. Yes, I have managed to move off the page of granny squares to other things and even embrace knitting. It is a gift. I have never said this, but I actually think I'm a pretty decent knitter. All of us are given gifts. Some might seem obvious, like this morning when our sister Trina sang. That's an obvious gift, right? We're not going to dispute that. There are some people that sing that when they open their mouth, it's like magic comes through it. You open yours too, and you're feeling something, but there are obviously some people who sang. And when they open it up, we're like that is anointed, that song touches us. This week I was listening to Jennifer Hudson and she was singing Ain't No Way by Aretha Franklin. And I'm like, whenever Jennifer Hudson sings, it is like she hits the right key and it is so perfect and it is so much soul. But I was sharing with my son that that kind of voice doesn't just come to you because you have the gift. She's been through some pain She's been resilient, and that gets added to her voice. And so when she sings, I can't get enough of what she's singing. You feel it. You know it. Some gifts are recognizable, such as Trina and Jennifer Hudson. And some gifts may not be as recognizable to us. I have a birth mom, but I also have a surrogate mom, and her name is Mama Iona. 
and every year around this time she fixes a meal to die for loads and loads and loads of food and then she invites people people that are related to her people that are not related to her from people from all over gather up at her house one year one of her friends said yeah I'd love to do this but I you know I don't really enjoy cooking and so then Mama Iona says in the midst of that do you think that I put on this feast because I love to cook? <laughs> I do this because I love you all. And I recognize she had a second gift, and that's called the gift of hospitality. By cooking such a scrumptious meal and opening her home, she invited many people into community. I was one of those people. And yes, she was a good cook, but she cooked because she had the gift of hospitality, and she wanted people to feel and experience community. Some of you in here know how to welcome others. You know how to make people feel warm and invited in. You know how to make people feel included when they feel like a stranger. You know how to extend hospitality, and that's, that's a gift. This is where we enter the biblical text that you heard this morning. Jesus had some gifts. Can I get an amen? <laughs> we attribute many qualities to this guy. But today I am making the claim that Jesus was a whistleblower. Can you guys whistle for me? I need help. So anyway, whistling is a gift. As you can see, we struggled here today with whistling. <laughs> can everybody be a whistleblower? Jesus is arrested, we all know this story well, on some trumped up charges. In our political climate, we can relate to a judicial system and trumped up charges, or people getting off that may be guilty. We can relate to unfair processes that oppress and jail good people. Pilate recognized that there was no reason not to release Jesus, and yet the religious folks, somebody repeat that with me, the religious folks pressed hard at getting Jesus executed. It wasn't the secular people. It wasn't the people that don't believe. It was the religious people. They had a vendetta against Jesus. Maybe it was the time he told them about themselves. <laughs> Maybe it was because he did not kiss their blessed behind. Maybe it was because he spoke truth to power, no matter who it was. Maybe it was because he saw right through them, and he was far from pretentious, meaning he called a spade a spade. Maybe it was because he was powerful and his power shook them. Judas has nicely set him up to the Romans to be arrested. And Jesus keeps it real. He lets them know, I have nothing to hide. I am not the one. I'm being set up. He blows the whistle by letting them know they are being used for a greater purpose beyond himself. Sometimes religious folks and their beliefs can get you killed. Jesus blew the whistle on the piousness of organized religion, on their judgment of others. Jesus blew the whistle on the importance of people over profit. Hear me, America. People over profit. Never use people to make a point. When they wanted to use the lady they found in the bed, Jesus said, he who is without sin, go ahead. Jesus blew the whistle on the powers that be, and they did not like it. And even after his arrest, Jesus wouldn't meet violence with violence. And so in being passive, he blew the whistle on the evil intent of the firmly established religious institution. Jesus blew the whistle on truth. 
Jesus' proclamation in the scripture today, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify the truth. Can I hear you all whistle below? You're getting a little better. Maybe by three o'clock we might be on to something here. <laughs> whistle blowing is hard work. I've been working on it this week. Francis Hagen is being considered a Facebook whistleblower. A whistleblower tells the truth about the big system that could knock it out with one punch. The odds are stacked against the whistleblower. Francis Haugen filed a complaint with federal law enforcement and has testified on Capitol Hill after being an employee of Facebook that Facebook lives off of division in America and extremist behavior in the global world. In other words, she reveals that Facebook's own research shows it amplifies hate, misinformation, and political unrest, but the company hides that it know, but the company hides what it knows to the public. She took her own trolls before quitting because she knew she needed proof that nobody would believe her. She copied tens of thousands of Facebook pages showing Facebook internal research. One statement reads, we have evidence from a variety of sources that hate speech, divisive political speech, and misinformation on Facebook and the family of apps are affecting societies around the world. You see, it's easier to inspire anger than other emotions. We know this. If Facebook consumers are not angered, they spend less time on the site, and that means less money for Facebook. Facebook makes money the more you consume their content. And the angrier you get, guess what? The longer you stay. Whistleblower Haugen has shown that hateful, polarizing content gets more distribution. Are you surprised? Facebook puts profit over safety. But we know that the God of this world is profit. Many people and systems put profit before the safety of people. We only have to look at the polarizing response to COVID to see we have often put profit over people. Today, we are reflecting on gratitude. One thing we can all be grateful for is the gifts that God has shared with us. Now, you may not be able to sing like Trina, <laughs> and you may not be able to preach like Pastor, <laughs> but you can share the love of Jesus. You can share your journey. I remember this saying that has stuck with me for a long time, God's gift to you is your life, but what you do with it is your gift to God. Amen. What are the gifts that lay nestled in you? What are you good at? that you could do almost with your eyes closed? How do you use your gifts in service to Christ? How do you use your gifts to better others in our world? How do your gifts help other people? As I shared before, when my grandmother was declining in health, I found myself returning to crocheting. I picked up knitting along the way and now I cannot talk about it, but sometimes when I can't talk about things that are bothering me, I can knit about it. It's like a prayer of sorts, working out the knots that are going on in my life. I realized that my grandmother was on to something and she stayed connected to the Holy Spirit. She'd be singing throughout the day those songs, and then in the evening she'd get that crocheting and begin to crochet. And every now and then, like I did this weekend, I make something and complete it. I had been knitting intensely for a friend to give her a gift for her birthday. And this weekend was her birthday and I was done. Something made with my own hands with lots of prayer and love, a gift. And it was beautiful as I saw my friend open this gift and how much it blessed her. To take the time to make something for someone else, that's a gift. And I got that gift from God and my, my grandmother. 
And you too, all of you have unique gifts. They're yours. They're yours. They're special. So this holiday, as we waver between a good meal and the awareness of the indigenous people and what our arrival meant to them, it's good to appreciate the gifts that God has given to us because those gifts allow and equip us to be star shining bright in the world. Good luck with uh, whistleblowing. Amen. <laughs>